Tonight, I'm excited to welcome Nino Ricci to Harvard Bookstore to read from his most recent novel, The Origin of Species. Mr. Ricci is the author of four previous novels, including Lives of the Saints, which received international acclaim, was, tra was translated into 13 languages, and earned Mr. Ricci the Governor General's Award for Fiction. Uh, Mr. Ricci is a former president of Penn Canada, and he was awarded the Governor General's Award uh, a second time after The Origin of Species initial Canadian publication in 2008. Uh, the Origin of Species introduces us to Alex Fredericangeli, maybe, <laughs> uh, a 30-something grad student living in Montreal in the 80s. Uh, while the world deals with the recent meltdown at Chernobyl, Alex deals with a bitter breakup, his dissertation linking the theory of evolution with the history of narrative, and the discovery that he has a five-year-old son living in Sweden. Uh, Library Journal called The Origin of Species a masterly coming-of-age story, and the Toronto Star called the book an ambitious, thrilling novel that resists encapsulation and takes not a single misstep. Ricci triumphs utterly in rare achievement. Thanks for coming out. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is the sort of event that uh, uh, makes me want to continue to be a writer. Uh, it becomes harder and harder these days to do readings in uh, independent bookstores. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be in this one. It's also a real pleasure and honor to be published by, by other press, which uh, also is, uh, for me, uh, uh, the sort of publisher that continues to make me want to be uh, a writer, a publisher that is dedicated to its authors and to uh, publishing books uh, that it loves and that it stands behind, as opposed to uh, um, what is increasingly happening in the publishing industry as it becomes more and more concentrated and as the forces of commercialization uh, dictate more and more what happens there. So, uh, so I want to thank uh, Judith Garevich, who's here in the audience, for, for publishing this book in the States. This book was uh, the product of many years of thought. I probably uh, first germ of inspiration I had as a first year undergrad when I, when I first read a section of The Origin of Species, Darwin's Origin of Species. And, and, and thought there was something there that was different than um, uh, some of the other, I guess, uh, totalizing meaning systems that I was exposed to in, uh, in, in university, and something that I didn't quite understand. Uh, and uh, it took me about 20 years, I guess, to uh, get around to trying to understand it more fully, and uh, this novel is partly uh, the result of that, uh, that process. Uh, I guess in simplest terms, uh, it seemed to me that the um, revolution that happened with Darwin is one that, that, that we're still living through and still coming to terms with. And I think it was one that fundamentally alt altered the way we think of ourselves as a species. Uh, I think the, the sort of dominant mode of, uh, of thinking of uh, humans till then had been a, a kind of uh, theological one, and, and one in which humans were considered uh, unique in creation. Uh, creatures that really stood apart from the rest of creation, who stood apart from nature in some sense, and, and who were, uh, c who considered themselves sort of the, uh, uh, the rulers of creation, or the, the, the beings for which uh, the rest of creation had been uh, created. Uh, I think in a Darwinian uh, scheme, it becomes harder to have such lofty notions about who we are and why we're here, uh, and, and becomes, uh, um, uh, more a matter of thinking ourselves merely as, as animals amidst, amidst other animals, as, as creatures who form part of an ecosystem uh, that was not created for us, uh, but that we are merely parts of and need to find a way to live with, uh, perhaps more um, uh, sympathetically than we have to date. And that's part of the, the dialogue, I guess, that's going on in this book. This book isn't a promotion of a Darwinian uh, worldview. I don't write books to, to promote things. I write books to pose questions and to try and uh, look at human experience from different angles. And that particular angle is one that uh, informs, I guess, the, the deep structure of this book. Uh, but uh, the book is a novel. It's a story about uh, the characters. It's about Alex Fratacangeli is a, <laughs> is a sort of uh, North Americanized uh, pronunciation of that name, uh, and one that uh, Alex would probably use for himself. 
and about his relationship with a woman named Esther, who he meets in the first chapter of this book. Esther suffers from multiple sclerosis, and she becomes a, a, a moving force uh, in Alex's life and a kind of cathartic influence and, and one who, uh, I guess, brings him to uh, a maturity that he uh, certainly lacks at the outset. Uh, and she also stands uh, as a kind of um, opposite argument to the, the standard understanding, I guess, of uh, a Darwinian worldview, which, uh, which really, uh, in its uh, simplest and most bastardized version, envisions a, a sort of uh, uh, cruel uh, universe in which every organism is fighting against every other organism. Uh, on the other hand, we have someone like Esther, who is this tremendous force for good uh, in people's lives and uh, is ex extremely transformative, but from a genetic or Darwinian point of view, is a kind of evolutionary error. Uh, someone who uh, evolution in the normal course of things would have bred out of existence, and yet, uh, and yet she is this tremendous force for change and for good in, uh, in people's lives. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, the... <laughs> The, the central um, uh, tension uh, in, uh, in the novel. And there are various other things that, that hang off of that, including uh, Alex's relationship with his uh, psychoanalyst, Dr. Klein, uh, amongst other per people he has turned to for help. He has, uh, uh, he's been seeing a psychoanalyst when the book opens for about uh, three or four months, not convinced that it's actually doing him any good, um, uh, and yet he can't bring himself to uh, to break off the relationship. And the section I'm going to read to you uh, takes place uh, early on in the book, um, second chapter. In the first chapter, we meet Esther, and Alex meets Esther, and uh, he has a fairly intense initial encounter uh, with her. And uh, immediately after that, he rushes off to his, uh, to his appointment with his psychoanalysis. So the year is 1986, that's right, 86, around the time of the uh, Chernobyl disaster, and uh, the place is Montreal. <clears throat> it was a 13-minute walk all uphill from Alex's apartment building to Dr. Klein's office, up Mackay Street to Sherbrooke, past the Unitarian Church and the Linton Apartments, past Chelsea Place on Simpson with its beautiful courtyard and Georgian-style townhouses, past w Percy Walters Park, which someone had rechristened in graffiti Parc Mère de Chien, and which sported, for some reason, a bust of Simone Bolivar. From the park, you could just see the back of Pierre Trudeau's house, perched on the slope that rose up to Pine Avenue, looking unrevealing and fortress-like with its Art Deco austerity. The rumor was that you could see the great man himself heading off on foot every morning along Pine toward the law firm where he'd taken up a sinecure after quitting his job as the nation's leader. Alex often took a detour from the route up McGregor in the hopes of catching a glimpse of him, making his way up to Pine by the steps at the eastern end of the park, which came out not twenty feet from Trudeau's front door. But so far, the only outcome of his skulking was that he had probably become a person of interest to the Cuban consulate across the street, which had boosted its usual phalanx of security cameras in the wake of a recent firebombing. Dr. Klein worked from an outbuilding of the Montreal General that served as some sort of rehab. It stood at the head of another steep set of stairs that came up from Pine, and the symbolism of all this climbing was not lost on Alex, and passed along the high fence schoolyard of the Academy Michel Provost, whose children's sounds and construction paper decorated windows always filled Alex with a not so obscure sense of shame. The rehab building sat four square and gloomy amidst a clump of spindly pines at the top of the steps. To the west, above the treetops, you could make out the upper stories of the Montreal General. To the north, up the slopes, the red roof lines of the Shriners Children's Hospital, and then the undifferentiated woods of Mount Royal Park. Alex had never quite been able to determine what went on at the rehab, except that everyone there seemed much crazier than he was, with either the vacant stare of the overdrugged or the weird, screwed-up intensity of the perpetually embattled. He had ended up there by fluke. 
After his breakup with Liz, he had gone into the university's counseling center when his usual low-grade depression had taken a turn for the worse. And the center, being unequipped, it turned out, for any kind of long-term treatment, had sent him on to the health clinic for a referral. That was where he had met Dr. Klein, who worked shifts there as a medical doctor. Actually, I'm just setting up a practice, Dr. Klein had said, clearing his throat. I might be able to fit you in. The look of him then had hardly inspired confidence. Everything about him was boyish and gawky, his mop of hair, his adolescent thinness, the way his doctor's smock hung on him like a disguise. Even the way he'd put the thing had sounded suspect, as if he was shilling for clients. But Alex had been feeling pretty black at the time. He had moved into his place on Mackay by then, but didn't always trust himself to go out on his balcony. The counseling center had warned him it might be months before he found a placement. When can you see me, he asked. Dr. Klein made a show of looking through his agenda. I could put you in tomorrow. Alex hadn't even known Klein was a Freudian until he'd gone, uh, gone in the next day and seen the couch. The way we'll work is you'll lie on the couch and say whatever comes to you. That had been pretty well the full extent of their discussion of methods. Indeed, in the three months that Alex had been coming in, five days a week, 50 minutes a day, the word Freud, or for that matter, psychoanalysis, had not so much as crossed Dr. Klein's lips. Alex, though, who was not unfamiliar with Freud, recognized even these omissions as hallmarks of the Freudian system. The important thing was to keep the analysis free of all contaminating influences. Once to test the waters, Alex had pointedly asked Dr. about Dr. Klein's education, and the doctor had put him off at once. I don't think it would be useful to the therapy to talk about that. In fact, Alex couldn't believe his good luck at first. Freud was about as close as anyone came to being a hero for Alex. Back in first year undergrad, he had read the introductory lectures and had never looked back. He credited Freud with releasing him, finally and irreversibly, from the last shackles of the Catholic Church. He credited Freud with teaching him whatever little he understood about the mythopoeic mind. It had long been his dream to do an analysis, something he'd assumed would forever be beyond his financial means. But here in socialist Quebec, wonder of wonders, the treatment was fully and generously funded by the taxpayer. The 13-minute walk to the clinic meant that Alex arrived, as he saw from the hall clock, some 12 minutes late for his appointment. He was happy to be spared waiting in what passed for the building's reception room, a squalor de fourier with a torn vinyl couch and a few ratty chairs where there was not so much as a reception desk or even a sign to show what sort of facility one had entered. Alex hurried past the vaguely familiar presences shuffling through the halls, inmates, outpatients, cleaning staff, to Dr. Klein's office, or at least the office he was to be found in, for there was no indication, such as a nameplate on the door, that it was actually his. As always, when Alex was late, the door was slightly ajar. Alex gave a knock, but then pushed through without waiting for a response. There at his desk sat Dr. Klein in all his sartorial splendor, permapressed trousered and gabardine jacketed, not poring over some new psychoanalytic text or the notes from some other patient, not even furrow-browed in concentration, but cross-legged and blank-eyed as if he had simply been waiting for Alex without a significant thought in his head. It came to Alex in a rush how contemptible he found this man, for his novice's exactitude and adherence to the rules, for his ill-fitting sports coats and anachronistically long sideburns, for his insipid commentary and insights, for the fact that he was such a boy finally, awkward and set to his task and blind to the plodding unimaginativeness of his methods. Alex would have liked to have been in the hands of someone he might comfortably turn himself over to, not this wet behind his biggish ears apprentice who was at most only a year or two older than himself. Dr. Klein nodded to him as he came in, said nothing about his being late, expre expressed nothing in his body language that might give Alex a window into his character and hence interfere with the necessary process of transference. Another word, of course, 
that had never crossed the doctor's lips. At once, Alex removed his shoes and lay down on the couch. In all the weeks he had been coming here, Alex figured he had not held Dr. Klein in his gaze for more than an accumulated total of five or six minutes, a few seconds when he came in, a few when he left, maybe one or two stolen ones while he removed or replaced his shoes. It felt increasingly ludicrous, this sort of relationship. Far from keeping Alex from any hint of Dr. Klein's real nature, it only seemed to heighten his sense of it. Alex was on the couch. I met a woman in my building today who has multiple sclerosis, he said, in an attempt to follow the rules, just speak what was uppermost in his mind. But the more he talked about Esther, the more his whole encounter with her seemed tainted. There was no way he was going to mention the incident at Ogilvy's, though he could still feel the warmth in his hands of the bag with Esther's urine-soaked underwear. She seems quite an amazing woman, he ended lamely, thus flattening out all the nuance of their meeting. Dr. Klein had yet to say a word. Alex lapsed into one of the silences that were becoming more and more frequent of late, biding his time doing an inventory of whatever of the room's Spartan furnishings he could make out from where he lay. The vaguely African etching above the couch with its abstracted sea and animal images, in particular a largish fish that Alex figured must be somehow significant. The unframed poster on the wall opposite of the 1976 Olympics, the bookshelf near the window that held a few bound annuals from the Canadian Medical Association, a featureless tome that Alex supposed was a guide to antipsychotic pharmaceuticals, and a copy of Time magazine that looked like it had been picked up in passing from the reception area. Yet all this evidence was ultimately inconclusive, given the uncertainty of the doctor's permanence here. Maybe you're talking about your new friend, Dr. Klein said finally, and Alex, Alex cringed at the phrase, new friend, because you don't want to pick up where we left off, talking about Liz. And maybe that's why you were 15 minutes late. 12 minutes, asshole, Alex thought, though he also thought, you're damn right I don't want to talk about Liz, a topic he was thoroughly tired of, but was one of the few Dr. Klein seemed to think worthy of his attention. This was a constant tussle between the two of them, what Dr. Klein deemed significant and what he deemed evasion, what he thought was the point of something and what he thought was beside it. Once, Alex had spent almost an entire session talking about the shoe rack that had stood in the furnace room of his childhood home, a crudely fashioned thing that his father had cobbled together out of old wood scraps. In Alex's mind, it had seemed suddenly like Proust's Madeleine, the nexus of every important question that had ever pressed on him, because it had been so makeshift and dusty and insignificant and yet an integral part of his life for many years, and because now that his father had sold the farm, it had probably passed away forever from the world, though his first Sunday shoes had sat there, and the shoes he had got in Italy when he was 13, and then his father's mud cake work boots, his mother's bloated loafers turned farm shoes, the cracked hobnailed boots that his grandfather had brought over with him on the boat, a whole history of work and rites of passage and loss. But, when, but Dr. Klein, when Alex had finished, had said, maybe you're still blaming your father for the fact that you were poor. Wrong, 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 Alex had thought. Why did everything have to go back to some childish sense of grievance? Surely it had to be possible to look beyond your little Oedipal struggles to the occasional bigger question about the way things were in the world, for instance, and what they might mean. Take that shoe rack. What had become of it? And why did it hold such a numinous place in Alex's consciousness as if the weight of existence rested on it? I don't know why it's more important to talk about Liz and about this person I've met who might be dying, he said now, surprised at how pleasant it felt to put on this show of indignation. Is she really dying, Dr. Klein said? Too late, Alex remembered he was speaking to someone actually trained as a medical doctor. Well, she does have MS. Dr. Klein relented. I can see how that would affect you, he said, with what seemed almost like real sympathy, which of course had the result of making Alex feel obliged to speak about Liz again. 
The truth of the matter, which Alex was, on, was only sporadically successful at hiding from himself, was that Dr. Klein was pretty much on target where Liz was concerned. The reason Alex didn't want to talk about her was that he still couldn't bring himself to face up to the weirdness the relationship had taken on in its final awful months. Of course, Alex had more or less admitted from the outset that it was the breakup with Liz that had driven him here, though that had been a whopping evasion in its own right. The thing about Liz, he said, trying this on, was that everything about her was a lie. She wanted to be this bohemian, this radical feminist, but underneath that she was just a conservative. Then she hated me because I pretended to believe in this other version of her. What makes you say that, the doctor said. I just know it, that's all. There was a silence while Dr. Klein gave Alex time to ponder the irrationality of his reply. Then, because the silence had to be filled, Alex said, I saw it all at the end, how she just wanted someone to dominate her, but then she would have hated me for that too. Maybe, Dr. Klein said, you're inventing a situation that couldn't possibly have worked so you, so you can feel justified for having ended it. The same issue has come up, I think, when you've talked about your dissertation. When had he talked about his dissertation? Clearly that had been a mistake. There seemed something oddly Puritan in the doctor's take on things, as if to go on with something was somehow always more psychically sound than to end it. In this case, he was wide of the mark. Breaking up had been the only thing in their relationship that he and Liz had been right about. From the clock above the door, which he could just make out if he twisted his head, Alex saw that they were already at the halfway mark. A familiar panic went through him. What was he doing forever fighting this man whom he'd come to for help? Why did he continue to avoid the most important things? He had yet to say a word, for instance, about Desmond and the Galapagos. He had yet to say a word about his son. These were matters of far greater import than Liz or his dissertation, and yet he hadn't gone anywhere near them, as if, for all his imagined self-knowing, he was uh, as classically repressed as any of Freud's Viennese hysterics. Of course, it might also be the case that he was just an idiot, a bourgeois with too much time on his hands, bilking the already overburdened healthcare system to the tune of $43 per 50-minute session. If he continued to see the doctor at all, it was only for this, that since he'd started his analysis, he felt unaccountably better. I'll stop there. Well, a lot of it was sort of haphazard. I started, uh, as I say, you know, in my undergrad years, and uh, and even at that point, uh, I was already looking for for ideas for novels, um, and because uh, you know it, I wasn't writing at the time, or I was writing, but it was certainly my intention to be a writer from uh, from a young age, and um, and so every once in a while, I I'd, I'd try and pick something up that sort of would feed the fires and the, uh, probably the next uh, significant thing I read was uh, The Selfish Gene by uh, Richard Dawkins um, which was really probably Richard Dawkins first uh, sort of big hit uh, as a evolutionary theorist and uh, and it was uh, it was a wonderfully dark view of uh, <laughs> of uh, uh, of being human, and uh, and it really helped crystallize, I guess, my own understanding of uh, of evolution and how it works. Um, that was the book that I guess uh, popularized this notion that uh, that evolution proceeds not by uh, by what we do as individuals, but what our genes decide. That it's really the gene that is making the important decisions in evolution, and. Uh, and you know things like humans are just sort of elaborate machines that genes have built so that they can you know uh, propagate uh, and um, it it it's a humbling way of looking at uh, oneself as an individual uh, and he also made some you know fairly uh, convincing arguments there uh, about how even things like altruism can be understood in an evolutionary framework that uh, for instance, uh, you know, if my, uh, you know, my genes know that my brother has some of their copies, so, you know, if my brother falls into a lake, I'm sort of half motivated to jump in and uh, and save him for purely selfish reasons, uh, because, 
I'm saving some of my own genetic uh, material in, in doing so. Um, so, uh, so that was sort of the next step. Uh, when I actually came to the point of writing the book, I sort of immersed myself a bit more fully in, in the actual writings of Darwin and uh, other theorists. One of the books that was uh, probably most interesting to me was The Voyage of the Beagle, uh, which is a great travel log. Uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, had a chance to read it, but it, it details the, uh, the voyage that, uh, that Darwin took as a young man around the world on this ship, the Beagle, that really was uh, uh, foundational for him in terms of his uh, uh, later writings. Uh, and it was sort of the, um, uh, I mean, he, he must have been one of the first amateurs to, to do that kind of round the world trip. What, you know, in the 60s became very popular amongst backpackers. Darwin had been doing essentially in the 1830s. Uh, uh, and, and this was before he had any sort of set notions about anything. He, he, uh, he hadn't been a very good student. Um, he had, his father, who was a doctor, had sent him to medical school in Edinburgh, which was the respected university of the day. And, uh, and Darwin just didn't take to, to medicine. He, um, um, I think after his first experience in the, the operating theater, this was before uh, anesthesia had been uh, developed. Um, he decided medicine was not for him. So he went home and told his dad, you know, Dad, I'm, I'm not going to follow in your footsteps. And I guess what uh, people of um, uh, means did in those days with sons that they couldn't place in respectable professions was they sent them to Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> so off uh, Darwin went to Cambridge where he uh, rode horses and gambled and uh, collected beetles, uh, which was all the rage in uh, in England at the time. Uh, he spent a lot of time competing with his friends to see who could collect the most beetles. And uh, his plan was to, uh, to become a uh, minister uh, and get a nice parsonage somewhere so that he could continue collecting beetles, essentially. Because uh, he, he knew he couldn't rely on his dad to support him all his life. So he'd have to have some kind of an income. So that was his plan. And then this chance came up to go on this trip, this, on this boat. And he managed to get uh, his uh, some of his teachers and I think one of his uncles to convince his father to let him go on this trip, and um, and it really ended up changing his life. And that book uh, uh, was um, uh, was quite helpful to me in understanding, I guess, the the process by which Darwin came to develop his theory. Uh, and it, it also comes up in the book in um, uh, in a trip that. Dar that, uh, that Alex ends up making to the Galapagos. Um, uh, it was in the Galapagos that the Darwin saw the things that would become the basis for, uh, for his theory. And, um, uh, and partway into this novel, we, we, there's a, an extended flashback where we see uh, Alex's own uh, Galapagan experience. And, and uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of my uh, insight about that came from, from the Voyage of the Beagle and also from a trip that I took to the Galapagos. Uh, my own trip to the Galapagos was a lot less eventful than, Dar than Alex's uh, and a lot less traumatic. Alex has a very bad trip <laughs> in the Galapagos uh, and goes there uh, in the early 80s at a time when it was still possible to travel around a bit more freely. Uh, travel there now is very controlled and you have to do very set itineraries. You have to buy into a tour. Uh, you're only allowed to go in very limited areas on the islands because it is so ecologically uh, sensitive. But uh, there was a time not so long ago when you could roam a bit more uh, freely and, and Alex ends up there. Uh, with a rather uh, deranged uh, naturalist uh, and, and has, as I say, a fairly traumatic experience that uh, uh, changes his life and becomes the, uh, the motive force for his own dissertation on uh, evolutionary theory and uh, uh, narrative. Um, so though, uh, I, that was some, some of it. Uh, there, I mean, there are other things that go on in the book. There are, sections that are set in Sweden. I, I happen to have spent a fair amount of time in Sweden, so it seemed a good place to, uh, uh, um, to go to, um, partly because I knew it, partly because it, uh, uh, there are interesting connections between Sweden and, and Canada that, uh, that, uh, that I was playing with. 
that's my, my medium-sized answer. Uh, well, it's a pretty conscious connection, in fact. I mean, the question of free will is, uh, it comes up a lot in the book, in the novel, and it's certainly at the core of uh, I, Darwinian thought. And, uh, you know, in fact, I did my graduate studies in the 80s, and, uh, you know, I read all those guys. I was uh, deeply into Derrida, and uh, I was uh, a big Foucauldian for a while. The first thing I ever published was a Foucauldian analysis of uh, feminist uh, theory. So, um, uh, you know, I was, I, I could talk the talk and, uh, but, and I found when I, once I graduated, there was a lot that was useful and interesting in, 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 uh, in that theory, but a lot that uh, um, didn't, uh, wasn't useful either in my personal life or in my writing. In some ways, a lot of it, a lot of that theory felt inimical to the process of writing. Um, and, and there were also certain aspects of it that, uh, I mean, when you get caught up in a certain kind of theoretical discourse, you, you start making assumptions that you just take for granted. And you take a step back and you, and you, and you think, well, is that correct? Is that right? And, uh, and one of the things that is going on in the novel is that there is this, this uh, this real tension between, you know, Alex's view of uh, uh, of literature and and all the stuff that's being taught to him in his theory classes, the the the, the big buzzword uh, at that time. I don't know how how strong this is now, but uh, was the idea of social construction that there there's no um, there's no meaningful way to talk about sort of the real. Uh, all we can talk about is our social constructions of it. Uh, and this, you know, is true across the board. So um, uh, the, for instance, the division of, of the genders is not, we can't talk about it biologically, we can only talk about the social construction of gender. Uh, the sciences, uh, we can't talk about the laws of physics as being somehow a real reflection of the world out there. They are only uh, our own social construction of whatever is out there. Uh, and it, uh, I mean, it, it radically undercuts the notion that there is some kind of, uh, uh, na um, I guess, biological uh, uh, definition uh, to, to the world out there. And around the same time that, uh, you know, social construction was big, this uh, Edward O. Wilson, I think, was, was was doing fairly foundational work in so, uh, social biology, in which he took a very Darwinian approach to disciplines like psychology and sociology, uh, and and uh, with the view that you know you ought to be able to talk about those fields in biological terms and uh, in Darwinian terms, as opposed to in the more squishy kind of. Uh, uh, language of the humanities that they usually get get talked about, and he was quite vilified by uh, by people of say the social construction school at the time because there's something that is quite deterministic uh, about about that uh, uh, that view. Um, uh, but has you know since then, I think that that kind of thinking has gained a lot of ground and uh, has gained a lot of. Uh, uh, Credibility, uh, and it it seems almost uh, kind of commonsensical that um, I mean, if you if you think of the if you think of evolu in evolutionary terms, here we if we arrive, uh, you know, on this planet with about three and a half billion years of genetic programming in us, that certain things are determined from birth. Uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, gender behaviors may in fact be biologically determined. Uh, um, it sort of, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the two schools are completely incompatible, but there's a, there's a strong tension between the social constructivist school and the uh, more Darwinian school. And that's certainly a tension that comes up in the novel. And, and there are a lot of issues around uh, free choice that would, yeah, that would that would point to this question of, uh, you know, why does this character sort of fumble through his life, uh, uh, finds it hard to commit, 
Um, and uh, there are questions that he asks himself. At one point, he imagines uh, writing a, a novel that's a sort of uh, anti-novel uh, about a character who gets trapped in a novel and suddenly finds that, you know, his life becomes increasingly constricted. Uh, you know, he can only talk in sort of short aphoristic phrases and his life is following this kind of a dramatic arc and uh, there's none of those days when he used to lounge around in bed watching TV for hours on end, you know, all these jump cuts and elisions. And, uh, and in a way, I thought of that novel really as a kind of parallel for what may in fact be <laughs> the nature of being alive, that so much of what happens to us is constricted in ways we don't think about. We, we go along with the, this illusion of free choice in so many things, and yet, you know, probably 95% of what we are is determined by the time we're born, uh, and the other 5% is probably, or most of the rest is determined by the time we're five. So, so how much room is left in there for? Uh, for free choice. Uh, it's, it's an open question in the book. I mean, I think it, you would find it hard to make an argument, uh, a convincing logical argument for free choice. Uh, it's much easier to make a, a convincing logical argument for total determinism, and yet uh, such an outlook is, uh, is abhorrent to us and, and, is ab uh, and goes against the way in which we think of ourselves as, as individuals, and yet why does he feel better it, when he's in his analysis? Uh, well, you know, I wonder if, uh, you know, part, well, I mean, I think part of what happens in analysis is exactly you set up uh, 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 an enemy. Uh, so it's nice for him to have this, this enemy that he can f fight against. But, uh, you know, at one point he wonders if, it really matters what they say. It's, it's, he almost feels there's this kind of animalistic tension going on between them, this, this vying for territory. And he could, have, he could talk about anything. It doesn't really matter. What matters more is just this, this relationship and this tension that he may, in fact, just be living out uh, a kind of animalistic relationship that is more important than the actual content of what's being uh, spoken about. I mean that's always a difficult question. I, you know, the, the uh, uh, the purest attitude is you know no. <laughs> I just write what I want, but but that's stupid uh, because because <laughs> uh, I you know I I write to communicate. I don't write so that I can babble to myself. I write because I'm trying to get something across. So. If I'm not getting that across, then that's a problem. So uh, yes, I, I think about it all the time. And uh, um, in terms of uh, you know how does in terms of different countries, that's a more it's a more complex issue. Um, um, you know, I I came to a writer uh, out of what I saw as a world tradition of writing. I mean, I didn't come thinking oh. You know, I'm coming out of a Canadian tradition or an uh, Italian tradition or, um, you know, I had a, a, a pantheon of writers and, you know, they're the pantheon that most people would point to, Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, you know, the standard names. Uh, and, and, uh, and those are the writers I refer to in my mind when I'm trying to write something. And, uh, uh, and one sense as a writer is that, you know, you're trying to communicate not what it means to be from a particular country, but what it means to be human. Uh, and that's informed deeply by where you come from, but you hope it speaks across uh, uh, other borders. So, um, and my experience has been that when, you know, my writing is working, uh, it's speaking across uh, borders. Uh, and, and sometimes the best way to do that is by going most deeply into your own place and, and, and what you know. Um, so, so yes, I think about audience, and I think about you know what I need to do to get uh, across to them, but not in not in any simple kind of way, and not in any kind of uh, um, I guess pleasing way. Uh, I guess uh, I have a sense of what what I want to do that I want to disturb people in some way, <laughs> uh, and so what's the best way to get through the door? Uh, uh, so that I can do that, uh, that disturbing, and 
and you know there are all kinds of strategies for for doing that. The question of how uh, particular to be in writing is is always a difficult one. In this book, for instance, uh, you know Trudeau appears as a character. Uh, now he's a he's a political figure that uh, you know is fairly well known and has a kind of iconic value. And I could probably mention without dating the book, uh, but I was you know I was aware that it's a very uh, uh, it's very easy to step over that line. Uh, you start referring to more local things. Some translate and some don't. Some translate uh, across country borders. Some would not translate across generational borders um, and, and would feel uh, limiting. And you, you just have to feel your way around those lines and try and find uh, what, uh, what is going to work and what is not going to make something seem old three years later or five years later or is going to make something seem irrelevant to someone in another country or in another province or another city. So, uh, she, uh, in her case, she stayed uh, fairly true. Uh, and you know, she's probably the character who's most closely based on, uh, on, on an actual uh, person. And uh, uh, you know, partly because she, uh, she died, she's no longer around, it's... Um, I mean, it, give, it, 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 makes you, it makes me feel I, have, I had more of a license, in a sense, to see her uh, more broadly. Uh, and, um, um, and partly, I guess, because, uh, you know, as a, it's rare in life to find characters who are strong enough for fiction. Uh, <laughs> uh, you usually have to, you know, Either add bits or put characters together, or or put you know maybe people you know in situations that are more stressful, uh, because most of us spend uh, our lives in states of uh, quiescence that are not especially fictionally interesting. We we're happy you know far too often or bored far too often, uh, <laughs> uh, but here was someone who you know in that span of her life uh, was facing the essential questions every day, you know, uh, what it means to be alive, what it means to be facing imminent death. Uh, so it was already, you know, all the, ne all the necessary elements for fiction were already, were already there. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, partly for that reason, it didn't change much. I mean, I compressed her story somewhat and a lot is left out and what I knew of her is much different from what other people would have known. Uh, but uh, I think I was fairly true to my own uh, recollection of her because it it seemed to be what I needed. In fact, so. well, I you know I had these two ideas. I had the idea for a novel in which evolution would play a role, and then I had this life experience, uh, which was you know fairly important in my own life. And uh, Esther was someone who was uh, sort of my probably my first fan as a. It was before I'd published anything, but I would show her my writing, and she was not uh, a big reader. She was not a student of literature, but she was, for some reason, oddly supportive of my writing. Uh, and um, and I, you know, I took I took solace from that. She believed in me in a way that she had really no right to. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, and I and I had the sense then, knowing her, all, that. You know, this was something that was given to me. It was a story that was given to me. I didn't know if I would ever be up to g doing it justice, but it sat there in my mind as something that that I ought to uh, give voice to. And um, and then I had this idea, as I say, for a novel in which evolution had something to do, but I didn't know how to animate it. Uh, and at a certain point, it occurred to me that there was this natural point of uh, Contradiction and tension uh, between those two ideas, uh, and it's uh, the uh, a point of contradiction and tension is usually a good point to to begin a uh, a novel. So um, so yeah. So from once once I saw that connection point, that was really the moment at which the novel took uh, took shape for me. So. Great. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you so much for coming up.